Okay, so today is going to be on the appendicular skeleton. And so if we look at this slide here, this shows us the um, appendicular skeleton are all the bones that are in that white color or the bone color. So we have to look at, you have to be able to identify, first of all, identify all the bones. Second of all, you're gonna have to identify certain landmarks on the bones, right? So those landmarks are either gonna be like a projection, a bump coming off of it, and we're gonna call that a tubercle or a tuberosity or a trochanter, or it could be a hole in the bone, and then we're gonna call it a canal or a foramen, okay? So we're gonna to have to identify certain landmarks on each of the bones as well, right? All right, so um, there are all these bones that you have to know. Uh, you have to know the clavicle and the scapula, and the humerus, the radius, and ulna. We're gonna look at carpal bones, metacarpals, phalanges. Um, we're gonna look at the hip bone, the femur, the patella, the tibia, the fibula, the tarsal bones, metatarsal, and phalanges, all right? So <laughs> that's a lot of bones. We have to first identify those. And then, so we're gonna start with the upper extremity, and then we're gonna look at the lower extremity. Upper extremity means the shoulders and the arms. Lower extremity means the hips and the legs, right? So if we look at the arms here, or the upper extremity, first of all, we have this area Right here, we have this bone right here, which is called the clavicle, so that is your collarbone. And then we have this bone that you see on the back here, and that's called the scapula, and that's your shoulder blade. So the, the clavicle is your collarbone, and the scapula is your shoulder blade, right? Now together, those two bones form what we call the pectoral girdle, the pectoral girdle. So if that's a question on your lab or your lecture exam, what two bones make up the pectoral girdle? It would be clavicle and scapula, right? Then um, the the long arm, uh, the long bone in your arm is called the humerus, and in your forearm you have two bones. You have a one bone that's called the radius and one bone that's called the ulna, the radius and the ulna. The radius, if you were to look at your arm, the radius is the bone on your thumb side. The ulna is the bone on your pinky side, okay? So some people stick up their thumb like the Fonz and say, yeah, radical, that's rad, right? So radius, right? Or here's the ulna, starts with U. This is your pinky finger, P-U, P-U, right? Pinky, ulna. So you always have to know which side the radius is on and which side the ulna is on, okay? Okay. Then we're gonna look a little deeper and we're gonna go into the, um, carp the wrist area. We already know that that's called, that area is called the carpal area, right? So that's the carpal bones. So we'll look at the carpal bones we're just gonna identify them as a group and say those are the carpals or carpal bones. We're not gonna try to identify each one of those. Then we look into the palm of your hands and the palm of your hands are made up of these long bones that are called metacarpal bones or metacarpals. So right in the palms of your hands, those are long bones in there. Without the skin and the muscle, you think, oh, are they the fingers? No, they're not. They're in the palm of your hands, right? And then when we do look at the fingers, then we're gonna look at um, what we call phalanges, or another name for phalanges are digits. Okay, phalanges are digits. And we're gonna see that there's three of those in most of the fingers and only two phalanges in the thumb. Okay, so that's where I wanna start. Uh, let's, let's actually do a little summary here of the lower extremity, and then we'll start looking at the individual bones. So in the lower extremity, we have the hip bone, and a more medical term for the hip bone is called the coxal bone. So that's this right here. And that bone is actually made up of three separate bones. 
So you would have one on the left and then you'd have one on the right. And each one of those is made up of three different bones that have fused together. So we call it the coxal bone, but there's three different bones in the coxal bone. Then um, if we look at the leg bone here, this is actually the thigh. The thigh has a bone called the femur. It's the biggest and strongest bone in your body. So we call this the thigh. And then in your shin area, we call this your leg, right? So we got the thigh and the leg. In the leg, there are two bones. The bigger bone is called the tibia, and the smaller bone is called the fibula. Right? In your ankle area, you have bones that are called the tarsal bones. So in the wrist, you had the carpal bones. In the ankle, you have the tarsal bones. Then you have those long bones in the arch of your foot, and those are called the metatarsal bones. And then you have your toes, and those are also called phalanges. Okay, phalanges. So we have phalanges as fingers and phalanges as toes. Let's see. Reset. All, right. All right, so let's take a look at that um, clavicle again. Again, the clavicle is the collarbone, and the collarbone has two ends to it. This end of the clavicle is called the sternal end right? Because it's touching the sternum. This end of the clavicle over here, we call the acromial end. This will make a little more sense when we talk about the scapula, but this thing right here is the acromion, and that's a point on the scapula. So that's why we call this end of the scapula the acromial end, I mean this end of the clavicle, the acromial end of the clavicle. Okay, so we've got the sternal end and then we have the acromial end, right? So on the lab exam, you're going to see a clavicle and you have to figure out which is the acromial end and which is the sternal end. You're not gonna see it on the skeleton like this, right? You're just gonna see the bone. So when we look at the ends of it, what you're going to notice is that on the sternal end, it has a really flat edge, you know, a very blunt edge, just a very blunt edge. And on the acromial end, you're not going to have that. Okay, um, so this is what the clavicle looks like then. This is the sternal end. You see how flat and blunt that is? That's how we know that's the sternal end. This end here is flat, but it doesn't have a blunt end. There's no blunt end over on that side, right? So that's the acromial end. So this is what you'll see on your lab exam. You'd have to identify it. This is the clavicle and then you'd have to be able to identify the acromial end or the sternal end, right? You have to know the right or left. Not on this one. I'll tell you which ones you have to know right or left on, though. There are a few that you have to know if it's your right or your left. Okay, so now let's look at the... Whoops, didn't want to do that. Now let's look at the scapula. So the scapula are your shoulder blades. And so when you're looking at someone's back, this is what you're looking at over here. You're looking at this view of it. And so first of all, we notice that it looks kind of um, like a triangle. So we have this superior border, which isn't on your lab list, but then we have this 
medial border that is on your lab list, and we have a lateral border that's on your lab list. And where the medial and lateral border come together, we have an inferior angle. So inferior angle, medial border, and lateral border are all going to be on your lab exam. Some of these we're going to take out by doing a palpation quiz, but I'm going to talk about that later, right? So for right now, you need to know where all of these things are. Okay, so that's our, that looks like our triangle. <clears throat> then we have this thing that sticks out. So this is one of those projections I was telling you about. And since it's a long projection like this, we call it a spine. So that is the spine of the scapula. Spine of the scapula. Now the spine of the scapula ends at this expansion up here. And that expansion we call the acromion. Okay, so I talked about that acromion. I said that that is where the acromial end of the clavicle articulates. And when I say articulate, I mean that two bones where two bones come together. So this is the acromial end of the um, scapula, or just the acromion, you can call it. The acromion. Okay. Now, underneath each one, underneath this spine then, you see that you have this indentation right here. And on top of the spine, you have an indentation right there. So we give those names as well. So this one that's below the spine, we call the infraspinous fossa. Infra. There's a typo on that slide. Infraspinous fossa. Fossa means an indentation. That's what fossa means. And above it, we have the supraspinous fossa. And again, supra, it's telling you in the name. Supra means above, spinous means the spine, so above the spine, and fossa means the indentation. So the indentation above the spine. Infrafossa means the indentation below the spine. So then if we look at the side that's up against your rib cage, this is the side up against your rib cage. Okay? And so um, we still we can see the superior border. You can see the medial border. You can see the lateral border. You can see the inferior angle. So you see all those things. You can see the acromion kind of here, the tallest the highest, most superior structure. But then you see this other projection right here. And this other projection is called the coracoid process. Coracoid process. Right? You can't feel the coracoid process. It's kind of deep inside there. Right? The other thing that we have... Um, you know, if you just look at the whole bulk of the, the largest bulk of the scapula, that whole thing is called the body of the scapula. But on the body of the scapula, on the side that is touching the ribs, on the side opposite of the spine, we see another indentation. And so this indentation right in here is called the subscapular fossa. Subscapular fossa. So in these fossas, this is where muscles like to just nestle in. So we have like the subscapularis muscle that just likes to nestle right in there. On the supraspinous fossa, there's the um, supraspinatus muscle. In the infraspinous, there's the infraspinatus muscle. So fossas are just indentations where muscles like to kind of nestle in, right? Now the last thing we have to talk about is an area that's right over here on the lateral side. So lateral side is furthest out, right? And that is the area where your humerus is going to fit into that to create that shoulder socket, okay? So if we look at that medial, if we look at a picture here 
Um, this we're looking, we're looking in at your shoulder, taking the humerus out, and we're just looking in at that scapula. You can see this area right here that we call the glenoid cavity, the glenoid cavity. So that's where your humerus fits in there. That's where the capsule goes around it. That's where you would tear the capsule and the humerus would pop out if you dislocated it, right? All right, so that's the scapula. So you have to know all of those points on the scapula. Next, we're going to look at the um, upper extremity. So in the upper extremity, we have the humerus that's in the arm, and then we have the radius and ulna that's in the forearm. And so this is what the humerus looks like, okay? So in the humerus, you can see the red, you know, you see this red over here and over here that's showing the humerus. You can see that there is a proximal end up here, and then there's a distal end down here. So we've got a proximal end and a distal end. Proximal means closer to where it sits in that shoulder socket. Distal means closer to the fingertips, right? All right, so this is the, up here, this is the proximal end. So let's just make that a little bit bigger and let's look at the proximal end. All right, so the first thing that we see on, pretty, on a lot of long bones is that we have this um, rounded area here and that rounded area we call the head. So that would be the head of the humerus, the head of the humerus. And so what's below every head? A neck, all right? So the humerus has two necks, actually. There's two necks with the humerus. The first neck is, so a neck is kind of, you know, the head is bigger and then the neck is a little bit narrower, right? So the first one that we have, we can see where that head starts to indent inwards. So it's a little, it just, there's an indentation there. That is called the, <coughs> excuse me, the anatomical neck. The anatomical neck, okay? So whenever you have a head on a long bone, you're gonna have an anatomical neck. And most of the time we just call it the neck, the neck of the femur, right? But um, on this one, we're gonna call it the anatomical neck because there's actually a second neck. And the second neck is this area right down here. And that's called the surgical neck. Why do you think we call it the surgical neck? That's where most of the breaks occur in the humerus, is right in this surgical neck. Okay. All right, so, um, all right, so we've got those areas. Then we have two bumps that we have to know on the proximal end. So the first projection or bump that we see is larger. So it's this whole area in here, and that is called the greater tubercle. So tubercle means a projection. It's bumped out. You can see that projection. Okay, now there's another bump that it bumps out right about here, and it's a little bit smaller. And so we're gonna call that the lesser tubercle because it's smaller, we call it lesser. So we have those two landmarks that we have to identify on the bone. So that's it then for the proximal end. Now we wanna look at the distal end of the humerus. Oh wait, there's one do we have the deltoid tuberosity? Um, so I'm not sure, I think we still have the deltoid tuberosity on your uh, lab list, so I'm gonna just show you where that is. So the deltoid tuberosity kind of runs down the length of the diaphysis, or the shaft, 
And it's a small projection. It's called the deltoid tuberosity. And it's where your deltoid muscle, which is your shoulder muscle here, that's where it attaches into the bone. Wherever we see projections like this, that's where a, a muscle attaches. That's where a tendon attaches. So a muscle attaches to a tendon, which attaches to the bone. So the deltoid tuberosity is named because deltoid is the name of the muscle that attaches there. And tuberosity just means that it's a projection. It, it's a projection, a rough spot on the bone. Right? Okay, then if we look at the distal end here, so this is down by the elbow, right? This is by the elbow end. So it's distal. All right, so on here, um, there are, you can see the, the shaft here, the diaphysis of the bone of the humerus starts to flare out, right? So here's your diaphysis, and then you see it flaring out. Well, where it flares out, we call those flared areas um, epicondyles. So we have the, the bigger one that flares out. So this whole area in here that's flaring out, we call that the medial epicondyle. And the area over here, which isn't quite as sharp of a flaring out, we call that the lateral epicondyle. Yes. Medial and lateral is referring to what direction it's pointing yep. to on yep. the body. Okay. That is. So medial and lateral are always referring to medial is closer to the midline, lateral is further away from the midline of the body, right? The other thing to point out here is that whenever we are um, talking about um, medial and lateral, you want to make sure that that person or skeleton is in the anatomical position. So the anatomical position is where the hands are thumbs out. If they were standing, and some people stand with their thumbs in, now what is supposed to be medial now looks lateral. So you want thumbs out, feet shoulder width apart and pointing forward, right? Head straight ahead. So that's the anatomical position. Okay, this is showing the humerus and the, uh, from the back side. Um, so on the back side, you can see that greater tubercle, but you can't see the lesser tubercle. You can't see the deltoid tuberosity. But at the distal end, there is something you can see here. There's this big indentation in here, and that's where the ulna from your forearm is going to fit into that indentation. That indentation is called the olecranon fossa. So remember I said fossa is an indentation. So in this case, instead of a muscle fitting in there, another bone is going to fit in there and it's gonna create that joint so you can bend your elbow. What attaches to there? So it doesn't quite attach, but it articulates. The ulna articulates with it. There's an area on the ulna that fits right in there and allows your elbow to bend. I heard the groan. <laughs> Let's get through the hands, and then we're going to go through the lower. We'll ha take a break. We'll get through the, the um, radius ulna, the hands. We'll take a break. Then we'll look at the lower extremity, and then I want you guys to look at the bones that I have up here. right? So looking at the uh, forearm then, we have two bones in the forearm. One bone is called the ulna. And the other bone is called the radius. Radius is on which side? Thumb side, ulna is on the pinky side, right? Okay. So um, if we're looking at the posterior view, so in the anatomical position, this is the posterior view. So that bump that you feel on your elbow, that is called the olecranon. So we can see the olecranon right there. That's the olecranon. So you want to make sure you can identify it. If you look at the um, 
So if we're looking, this is the proximal end. So it's a big bump there. That's what the olecranon is, a bump. But if you look at the anterior side of it, it looks more like a notch, right? So that notch is what fits into that olecranon fossa. So we have the olecranon fitting into the olecranon fossa of the humerus. Okay. All right. Then the, then the other bone is the radius. So let's look at the proximal end of the radius. Can I just ask a quick you question? You can. So you said olecranon fossa. I don't see that in the book. Is that the same as the trochlear notch? So the olecranon fossa was on the humerus. Oh, okay. Yep, the olecranon fossa is on the humerus, and then that olecranon, you can even feel it as it's moving in and out of the olecranon fossa. Okay, so it's this you, connection yep, point. Okay, yep. thank you. Okay, you can kind of feel that moving in and out of a, a notch in there. So that's moving in and out of the olecranon fossa that's on the humerus. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, now let's look at the radius while we're up here at the proximal end. The radius isn't quite as long as the ulna, and it has a real flat, blunt end. Uh, that's where it starts, and so that end of it we call the radial head. And the radial head bumps right up against the ulna. So it's really not coming in contact with the humerus at all. It's just bumping up against the, um, the ulna. Okay. So that's the proximal end of those two bones. Um, oh, the radial head? Sure, okay. that's the same thing. Okay. So head of radius Just or head of the radius is the same thing as the radial head. Same thing. Okay. There's another uh, little bump here on the radius on the proximal end, and we call that the radial tuberosity. So those are the two things that you have to know on the proximal end of the radius. And if we go way down here on the distal end of each one, we're going to look at the posterior view here. Okay, so this over on this side, this is the ulna, and this over on this side, this is the radius. Again, it's a posterior view, so we're looking at the back side right here down by your wrist. That's what we're looking at is down by the wrist on the back side, right? So first of all, the ulna, um, it widens out here. We have the, um, the head of the ulna where it expands. So this area here, this whole area, that's called the ulnar head or the head of the ulna, either one. Ulnar head or head of the ulna. But then we also see this other um, bump right here, and that is called the styloid process of the ulna. And so you can actually see that styloid process of the ulna. So you look on your pinky side, on the posterior side, and you see a bump there. That is the styloid process of the ulna. Okay. If we look at the radius then, the radius is on the thumb side, we can see the styloid process of the radius. That's a bump on the radius. So to feel that, if you were to, you know, stick your thumb up like Fonzie, A, eh, right? And you go right into that little groove in there that you, you feel in between these two tendons, that bump in that little groove. That is called the styloid process of the radius, that bump in there, right? So that little spot in there used to be called, you know, the farmers would call it the snuff box because they would, they'd snuff tobacco, right? So that's the snuff box right there, okay? And so that styloid process of the radius is right inside that snuff box. Okay. All right, so that's the radius and the ulna. So just bear with me because we're going to get through this here. And we're going to take a break. All right, so here we're looking at um, the hand. 
So this is right here. That's going to be that styloid process of the radius. Uh, on that right over there, that's going to be the styloid process of the ulna. And then we have all of these short bones in here. And these short bones, we're just going to call the carpals. We are not going to name them. The carpals each have their own individual names, but we're not gonna name them for our class. They're just the carpals. Then in the palm of the hand, this is the thumb side over here. So on the thumb side, in the palm of your hand, you have the first metacarpal. And then the pointer finger, the, in the palm, that's the, the second metacarpal. The middle finger in the palm of the hand is the third metacarpal, then the fourth, and then on your pinky side, you have the fifth metacarpal. So I don't, wanna, I don't want that to mislead you. I'm just telling you which, where they're located. They're not part of your fingers up here. They're all in that webbed area of your hand. So that would mean this is the First metacarpal, second metacarpal, third metacarpal, fourth metacarpal, fifth metacarpal. Right? All in the palm of your hand. Then we have the digits, and the digits are called phalanges or phalanx for singular. For one bone, one bone is a phalanx, multiple of those are phalanges, right? So for those, we have. If we look at your four fingers and not look at your thumb, you can see that there's these long bones. So there's one, two, three phalanges in each finger. There's a proximal one, a middle one, and a distal phalanx. Each one of these bones are a phalanx. So each finger has three phalanges. When we look at the thumb, though, and we look at there's only two long bones in there, we only have a proximal and a distal phalanx. Proximal and distal phalanx. Okay, another name for the thumb is called the pollux. Pollux. Let's take a look at the lower extremity. So in the lower extremity, we're going to first start out with the pelvic girdle. So the shoulder girdle was the clavicle and the scapula. The pelvic girdle is made up of those coxal bones. And coxal is C-O-X-A-L. So you have a coxal bone on the left, and then you have a coxal bone on the right. So there's two coxal bones, and those coxal bones are made up of three separate bones that fused together before birth. So if we look at this picture up here, it's all colored for you. The purple bone right here, that's called your ilium. So that's part of the coxal bone. The pink bone right here, that's called your pubis. And then the yellow bone right here, that's called your ischium. So those are the three bones that are in the coxal bone. You have to identify each of the individual bones, and then you have to identify landmarks on those bones, right? So this is a picture of your pelvis from the front. Let's first take a look at that. Um, up here where we were tagging the area as your pelvis, you, there's this indentation on the anterior side of that coxal bone, right there and right there. We call that the iliac fossa. Again, fossa is an indentation. So that's the iliac fossa. Oh, nuts. Oh, there we go. Another area on the um, ilium that you have to know is you see where it's, it indents right there? That indentation is called the sciatic notch. OK, 
Okay, here we see it on this side. You see that indentation right there? It's a big indentation, so we actually call it the greater sciatic notch. Greater sciatic notch. Okay, so this is the posterior side. It's a posterior view. Now, going back up to the ilium, if we look at the top of the ilium up here, there's a roughened area, and it looks like, like the crest of a mountain, right? So we call it the iliac crest, the iliac crest. You can see that iliac crest on the anterior side as well. Okay, so it's this area up here. This is the iliac crest. It's just the topmost part. Now that iliac crest comes down to a tip on both sides. We see it come down to a tip, and that tip is called the AS. I S. That's the abbreviation for it. It stands for the anterior superior iliac spine. ASIS. The anterior superior iliac spine. So that's an area that you have to identify on the you have to identify that on the palpation quiz, the ASIS. There's one on both sides. Okay. All right. Now, another thing that you have to identify, if we look down here a little lower, um, we see this cartilage here in between the two pubic bones. So remember the pu here, if you remember, this is the pubic bone here in blue, right? This whole area is the pubic bone. And then there's the right pubic bone on this side, okay? So where they come together, this area right here, it's a cartilage, it's not a bone. And we call that the pubic symphysis. That's the pubic symphysis. The last um, one that you have to know, the last structure that you have to know is on the ischial bone. And the ischial bone is kind of like the bone that you sit on. So this whole thing here is the ischial bone. Okay, so all of that's the ischial bone. Um, not right there, not here. Goes from there to there. And the very tip of the ischium, or ischial bone, the very tip of it is a roughened area. That's your butt bone that you sit on. And that is called the um, ischial tuberosity. Ischial tuberosity. Yep, those are your sit bones. That's what you sit on. Ischial tuberosities. Okay. You can see them really good over here. This whole roughened area, that's called the ischial tuberosity. This is the posterior view, your sit bones. All right, then we take a look at, this is the only thing that really is in your lecture notes for this chapter, um, to know the difference between a male and a female. This is the male, this is the female. The female has been adapted for childbirth. So everything on her is going to be wider. Actually, bones in general are, um, are different between males and females. We know males have all of those projections are going to be rougher and bigger on the males. 
mostly because they have a, a more muscle. They have more muscle fibers. They don't have more muscles, but each of their muscles is larger because they have more muscle fibers. So the muscles are stronger and they're pulling on the bones and that's making the bones build up that osteoblastic activity and those projections get bigger. So on the male, we see bigger, heavier um, bones that have bigger projections, rougher projections on them. But in the pelvis, uh, we see that the female has, she has smaller, smoother bones, but she is adapted, there's ad adaptations for childbirth. One of the adaptations is that these ischial bones, these, the ischium, they flare out. So they actually, on x-ray, they're going to look wider. They're not, they're not wider, but they flare out. And what does flaring out do? It makes this inlet right here bigger. That's the, that's the area where the baby is going to come through. So she has to have more space for the head of a baby to come through. What that also does in there then, if we look at the ischium, where the two ischium come together at that pubic symphysis, her angle is going to be bigger, like at 100 degrees, where if we look at the male, his angle is going to be smaller at 90 degrees. Again, she's going to be flared out. She's flaring out to provide enough space for that baby to come through during childbirth. And then the last thing is that if you look at the, um, the iliac crest on the male versus the iliac crest on the female, on the male, it's going to sit higher. So that iliac crest, if you looked at where the lumbar vertebrae are, it will actually sit at the level of L4 to L5. So it, those, the top of the hips is sitting higher in the male. In the female, if we look at the level of where hers is sitting, um, hers is going to be sitting more almost at the level of L5S1. So, you know, that's where we tend to come up with that phrase and we say, well, women have a lower center of gravity. They kind of do. Their core is lower on the spine than in the males, right? Okay, so let's look at the femur. So the femur is in the thigh. And so this is the anterior view. Let's look at the anterior view and let's look at the proximal end of the anterior view of the femur. The femur again is the thigh bone. So we can see at the tip of the, at the very proximal end of the femur, we have the head. So that's the head of the femur or the femoral head. We can see where that head indents and we call that the neck of the femur. We don't have to call it anatomical or surgical. There's only one neck in the femur. And then just like in the humerus, we see these big projections. So we have a really big projection that's called the greater trochanter. That's on the outside lateral hip area. Um, and then we have a smaller projection on the medial side that you can't see, you, uh, you can't feel, and that's called the lesser trochanter. You can see it on the bone, you can see it on x-ray, but you can't see it, you can't see where it's projecting out like you can with the greater trochanter, all right? On the posterior side, if we look at that, you can see the same thing, you can see the here we have the head, you can see the neck, you can see the greater trochanter, you can see the lateral, or the, um, you can see the greater trochanter and the lesser trochanter, but then you also see a tiny little bump there in between them, and that little bump is called the gluteal tuberosity. Gluteal tuberosity. So here's the distal end. So the distal end is near the knee, right? So we're looking at near the knee. So we have, um, it flares out again. We can see where it's flaring out here. We can see where it's flaring out here. So we have a medial epicondyle and we have a lateral epicondyle.
Okay, so we can see where it's flaring out like that. Now, how would you know that that's medial or lateral? You know, when it's on the skeleton or when it's on a person, you can tell it's medial or lateral. But if you just have the bone there, if you look at the head of the femur, do you think the head of the femur is going to be medial into the hip socket? Or do you think it's going to be lateral sticking out? Medial. Medial. It's going to be medial. So because you know the head is on the medial side, you know that the, this is going to be the medial epicondyle. Trochanter is the bump on the hip. So you know this is going to be the lateral epicondyle. All right, so we're going to continue then with the proximal end of the femur. So again, the proximal end is the end closest to the hip. That's the proximal end of the femur. And we're just going to go through that lab list, and we're going to figure out what you need to know. So we have the, the head of the femur is the ball. It's the ball at the end of the, the bone. Then we have the neck. So there's the neck. The neck always holds up the head. Now, if you remember, though, um, you don't have a surgical neck. So the only place you had a surgical neck was in the... Uh, the humerus, right? Other long bones just have a neck. They have, so the, the humerus had the anatomical neck and the surgical neck. All the other bones just have a neck. So this is the femoral neck or the neck of the femur, okay? Then we had these two large projections. We had one um, bigger one that's on the lateral side that's called the greater trochanter. We have a smaller one on the medial side that's called the lesser trochanter. So medial and, or greater and lesser. Now the greater one you can actually feel. You'd be able to palpate on someone. That'll be on our palpation quiz, right? Okay, then if we look at the posterior side, posterior view, you can still see the neck. You can still see the greater trochanter, lesser trochanter, but there's also another little tiny bump in there that we call the gluteal tuberosity. Gluteal tuberosity. So it's just a tiny bump where the gluteus muscle inserts. The gluteus is the butt muscle, buttocks muscle, right? So that's where that inserts. So those are the things you have to know on the proximal end of the femur. Now if we're going to look at the distal end of the femur, and the distal end of the femur then is near the knees, right? That's distal. So we're going to look at that. And so we have uh, these, we have epicondyles and condyles. Check your list here. Yeah, you have to know, you have to know the epicondyles, not the condyles. So the epicondyles, just like in the humerus, the epicondyles flare out, right? They flare out, and so you can actually feel those bumps where they're flaring out. We've got the medial and the lateral. How do we know what's medial? Well, if we go back and we look at the other end of the bone up here, that ball that fits into the socket, that has to go in into the socket. So that's going to actually be on the medial side. So if this is on the medial side, that means this is on the medial side, and that has to be the medial epicondyle then, right here. Since that's the medial epicondyle, the other way you can tell, this greater trochanter is the big bump you feel on the, on the hip. It's where the women flare out. Um, that's the greater trochanter on the lateral side, so then this must be the lateral epicondyle. Okay. Uh, then, if we look at the knee, we have just this structure right here. This is the kneecap, and all you have to identify, you have to identify the kneecap on your palpation quiz, and another name for that is patella. So you're not going to pull a card that says 
kneecap, you're going to pull a card that says patella. Okay, in the back of the kneecap, well, we're not going to identify any structures. We're just going to say that's the kneecap. Whoops. Okay, now we're going to look at the leg. So the femur was in the thigh. Now we're going to look in the leg. And in the leg, we have two bones down there. The larger bone is called the tibia. And the smaller bone is called the fibula, right? So we do not want to mix those two words up. You don't want to ever say tibula or fibia because you're going to get it wrong. It's like a combination of the two words, and I cannot give you that right if you write that down. It's tibia or fibula, okay? Fib, you, you know, a fib is a lie, so fibula has an L in it, fibula, okay? All right, so we're going to look at the proximal end, and the proximal end of the tibia and fibula are near the knees, so we'll look at the Proximal end first, see what's going on. This is the anterior view, so this is what you're seeing from the front. And so the first thing we have on there are the condyles. So there's, at the top here, there's a flat area. Um, and this part of the bone in here where it's flat, and then it covers just a, it's, it's like, um, here's your epicondyle. The epicondyle is on top of the condyle. So this is the condyle. So we have a medial and a lateral condyle. Now the way the tibia sits, it actually, you feel it all the way down the inside of your leg. It's, it's the bulk of the leg, so you feel it on the front, but you also feel it on the inside of the leg. The fibula is on the lateral side of the leg. It's on the outside of the leg. Another bump that you feel on the proximal end of the tibia is called the tibial tuberosity. It's right here. It's a bump that sticks out. That's where the ligament from the patella that came from the quadriceps muscle, that's where it attaches. And so on this tibial tuberosity, it's going to be bigger on the men because, you know, all of these projections are pretty much bigger on the men. They have uh, more muscle strength that pulls on these areas, stimulating the osteoblast, creating bigger bumps. But a lot of times uh, when these um, boys, young boys, they grow too fast or they're involved in too many athletics, it'll pull too hard on that tibial tuberosity and that tibial tuberosity grows bigger than it should and gets really irritated from the ligament pulling away from it and they get a disease called Ajgood Schlatter's disease. <coughs> That's how you spell Schlatter's. Osgood Schlatter's disease, right? It's painful. And we find that on women now, too, young girls who are doing um, way excessive uh, sports. Their ligaments will be pulling away, too, and sometimes they end up with a painful tibial tuberosity where that ligament is pulling away from that area, creating inflammation, creating osteoblast activity, making those areas bigger. Okay, so... I'm going to stick with the tibia here, and I'm going to go down to the other end. So this is the distal end of the tibia down here then. Um, the big, what we find here is this big hook-like structure down at the ankle. And that hook-like structure is called the medial malleolus. It's on the tibia, so sometimes you'll hear it as the tibial malleolus, but it's medial. It's on the inside of your ankle. So, I mean, I've heard some docs pronounce that malleolus. So I, it's either way, a horse apiece. Malleolus or malleolus, either way is correct. All right, so that's our tibia. Now let's look at the fibula. The fibula is the skinny, shorter bone in the, lower, in the leg. And so we look up again near the, uh, we look up near the knee. Okay, so here's our fibula, and there's this bump here where it, it, you can see it doesn't, it's not as tall 
is the tibia, and it articulates with the tibia in this little groove here right below the epicondyle, uh, right below the condyle, I should say, and um, that is called the head of the fibula. So it's right directly on the side of your leg. If you follow the seam of your jeans down the lateral side, just below your knee joint, you would feel a bump, and that bump is the head of the fibula. That's another bone that we're going to palpate in our palpation quiz. Okay. And so then the rest of this, this is just the fibula. Make sure you can identify the fibula. And if we go to the other end here, we see another, uh, another, the end, the distal end of it is flatter. It doesn't have quite a bit of a, a bump to it. It's flatter, and that's called the lateral malleolus or the fibular malleolus. And that's the bump on the outside of your ankle that you feel. Okay, and that's the bump on the outside. Okay, so um, that's your tibia and your fibula. Then finally, we have your foot. So finally on the foot, uh, we have the toes, right? So there's five toes that we call the phalanges. And each toe is made up of separate bones. And those separate bones are, we look over here. Okay, this bone here, this is your, from here to here, this is your great toe, right? That's your great toe. And we call that the hallux. Do you remember what we called the thumb? Pollux. pollux. So we've got the pollux and the hallux, right? Um, okay, so if we look at the hallux, there's two bones. There's a distal phalanx and a proximal phalanx. So there's just two bones, one joint. But if we look at the other toes from, so here's the second toe from here to here, you can see that we have a proximal phalanx, a distal phalanx, and then a middle phalanx. So that has three bones in that toe. And then same thing in the third one, we have proximal, middle, distal, fourth one, proximal, middle, distal, fifth one, proximal, middle, distal. So you have got three bones in all your toes, just like you did in your fingers, except for your thumb and your greater toe, um, they only have two bones. Okay. So those are the phalanges. You have to identify them collectively as the phalanges, right? But on the lecture exam, you might be asked how many bones are in the, in the, in the, the, the most of the phalanges or in the hallux or in the pollux. Okay, then we look at the metacarpals or metatarsals. And the metatarsals, these bones are found in the arch of your foot. So we just number them. There's five of them. Just like there were five metacarpals, there's metatarsal one, two, three, four, and five. So we're going to identify these collectively as the metatarsal bones or just short metatarsals. Either one would be fine. Then we go a little bit more proximal and we see all of the tarsal bones. So we can call them tarsal bones or we can call them tarsals and we have to identify them collectively. We're not gonna identify the individual ones. So we see one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, so there's, there's, uh, forgot this one, seven. So there's, um, there's, there's more bones in here. They're, they're all collectively known as the tarsals. Uh, we're not going to identify them individually, except for two of them. We're going to identify. Okay. So we do want to, we do want to identify this bone right here. This one, this is called the talus.
And we do want to identify this bone right here. This one's called the calcaneus. So the talus is not a tarsal, or is it? The talus is a tarsal bone. It's just a very large tarsal bone. So if we look over here in this picture, they're all the ankle bones. I mean, calcaneus really is a tarsal bone too. I would tag it like right here. This is where I'd be tagging the tarsal bones. This bone right here is the talus, and you can see the big bump there. So that big bump, that's going to sit right in between those two malleoli. So you have your medial malleolus from the tibia, your lateral malleolus from the fibula, and it makes this nice little arc in between the two malleoli. The tip, this, this um, dome on top of the talus, that fits right inside there, and it creates that ankle joint so that you can flex and extend your ankle. Right underneath that, we have the calcaneus. That's your heel bone. We'll be identifying that on the palpation quiz. Okay. Okay, now the last thing is that you have to be able to identify right and left on a few of the bones. There's going to be one station in your lab exam that you are going to identify whether the bone is a right or a left. You're going to say... Um, you, you type it out as right femur, left femur, right humerus, left humerus, right scapula, left scapula, right tibia, left tibia. So you just have to identify the bone and, and whether it's right or left. And again, just like everything else, right or left comes first. A person does not break their femur left. They break their left femur, right? Okay, so... You have to identify those, and to identify something like that, you have to um, pretty much identify two, you know, you have to identify two separate structures and know whether they are anterior or posterior, or are they medial or lateral, and those gives you, they, that gives you clues to discover whether that's a right or a left bone. So, for example, with this bone here on the femur, okay, let's look at the femur here. Um, we know that the head of the femur here has to go in to the socket. So we know this has to be the medial side, right? So then you would say, okay, I could take that bone and put it on this side, or I could put it on this side, but the head has to go in, right? Well, now let's look at what could be posterior. What do we know on this that's either anterior or posterior? Well, you do know um, on the posterior side here, um, you see the gluteal tuberosity. So if the gluteal tuberosity is on the back, and this is medial, which leg do you think that would be? Right. That would have to be your right leg, because that, that femur goes in, so this is going in, and that's felt on the back of it, so that has to be your right leg. So you're always looking for clues. What do you know on that bone that's anterior or posterior? What do you know that's medial or lateral? And you should be able to know very easily which ones, what, what is right and what is left. So you're not going to have to know all of the bones. I'm going to tell you which ones you do have to know. So uh, in the axial skeleton, not in the axial, in the appendicular skeleton, which is where we're at, um, the scapula. I think you should know what's, you know, what's uh, right or left. You know, for instance, the spine <coughs> is on the back. It's on the posterior side, right? And then you would know the medial or lateral border, or you'd know the socket. The socket, which is called the glenoid cavity, is lateral. So the spine is posterior, spine of the scapula is posterior, the glenoid cavity then is going to be lateral, and you should be able to tell then which scapula that is. You can even pick it up and put it on your own self. You can figure out which, if it's right or left. So we have to know scapula, 
You have to know the humerus. You have to know the femur. The tibia. And the radius, and that's it. Okay, scapula, humerus, femur, tibia, radius. So you'll have some time again on Wednesday when we get together uh, in lab. I would just check those bones out, make sure you could tell what's right or left. We've got both right and left in the boxes, so check them out, see if you can tell. Um, break time? What's that? Oh, that was the moon. Oh, sorry. Okay. We've got about 15 minutes. Okay. So anyway, that's, um, you can, you'll be able to tell on those uh, in lab on Wednesday. <laughs> two people at a time will be coming out to do the palpation quiz with me into the hallway. And the rest of you are in the lab on your own. So please don't take that entire time to study for the palpation quiz because what a waste of time that would be. Since this is, this palpation quiz goes in as a lab activity, doesn't go in as a, a, an exam activity at all. It's just a lab activity. Um, and you shouldn't have to study that. So you should be looking at the models again, maybe looking at what's right or left again, studying for that. And I'll give you time at the end in the first lab, I'll give you time at the end to start looking at your lecture exam stuff so you're not walking into the lecture exam cold. Okay? All right, that's it.